God, we thank you again for this privilege. We thank you that you are here with us. We know that you're here with us. Your presence has been here with us, and we can attest of that. And with that, we ask that as we read your word, we pray that through it you will open our eyes to see uh, our burdened hearts will be set free and we'll have a fresh perspective of you know, looking on things that are happening into our lives, Lord. So we ask that as we read your word, the word of life, that you are accompanied with your Holy Spirit, that you speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to talk to us this morning about being steadfast amidst trials. This book of James that we are going to read shortly, you know, it's not written for people living in ease, peace, or comfort. It is quite the contrary. From its first words that we will read, we see that it also challenges the readers who were scattered throughout the Mediterranean countryside and were possibly gathering in small house churches. They were believers who lived in poverty and persecution those times. However, as we read this book, From the tone, we don't see the soft edge you would expect from a people who are suffering or struggling. Rather, we hear from it a challenging and a coaching tone to cause the reader to rise above their current situations. He's not coming and inviting people for a pity party. Now that you guys are going through, you know, a lot of stuff, you know, let's, let's just hang on and let's be sorrowful together. That is not what he's calling the readers to, to pay attention to. And this author, who is James, we have a lot of... Um, views on who actually wrote this book. Very few gems are mentioned, about three of them, but the one that we know who wrote this was the brother of Jesus Christ, the half-brother of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we'll read, um, uh, Paul make a case for that in uh, Corinthians uh, 12 and 15, we can read that in Galatians 1, 19 and Matthew ch- chapter 13, verses 55, to actually let us know who the writer of this book know. We know that for sure, that he is James, the brother of Jesus. We also shortly will read that after uh, the death and burial and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, as written in Acts, that I've already mentioned, Acts 12 and 15, which is our book of history for this book. We discover that James became a leader in the church at Jerusalem alongside with Peter, the Lord's disciple. And also the tone of this would cause us to see what James is writing about. He's focused on writing to the Jews who became Christian or commonly called the Messianic Jews or Christ-following Jews. He He became a leader of this community, of this group of people. And at this time, there were two major challenges that they encountered deeply. There was a great famine That means they were in luck. And also the other factor was 
the Jews convert faced persecution from their Jewish leaders. You turn to be a Christian and you are in trouble. So they are troubled because now they, they can't even travel far to go find food because if they say they are Christian, now they are in another problem with their religious leaders. And so he wrote this letter, especially so that it will be distributed to these churches that were gathered in people's homes. And also the tone of this book and the structure tells us that it's very masculine how it is written by a man who closely dwell with the Lord and might have misused his language before becoming a believer. He probably said a lot of dumb and stupid things before he got born again. That is why he's going to warn the readers to watch their tongues. If you have your Bible, let us read together. James, a born servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes we just scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have it perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without Reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubt is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man and stable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers, withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuit. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to the people, to those who love him. And let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and perfect gift is from above and comes from the Father of light, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruit of his creatures. So then, my beloved brothers, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness 
and overflow of wickedness and receive with great meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not forgetful, is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you think he is religious and he does not brittle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit the orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. And that is God's word. Profoundly, we are hearing from this man called James. James, this half-brother of Jesus, exhorts us to pay attention to a few things here. First of all, as we have read through, we are exhorted to rejoice under the cross of Jesus Christ, even in the middle of various tough situations. Rejoice in them. And number two, he also tells us to ask patience from God. Because we will need it when we are tried. And also, he exhorts us to hearken to the word, to meditate on it, and to do it thereafter. Not just to listen, but also to do what it says. And lastly, majorly, it says, man may seem, but never be truly religious. Seem very religious, seem to have done a lot of things in the name of religion, but he says, you know, pure and undefiled religion before God is this. To visit the orphans and the widows in their troubles and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. <laughs> that is a lot for us to think about. That is a lot to keep us on check. This James, who is a half-brother of Jesus, tells us he actually says that he is a born servant of who? Of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. With prior information that he has and everything that he knows, he does not portray himself to the people listening to him as the brother of Jesus so that he will have more credibility, right? Right? Knowing that at the back of your mind, you'd, you, they normally say, you know, it's not about what you know, it's who you know, right? It's who you know who will pave your way for. You know, you, you're looking for a job in the government. It's not the papers. It's who you know, right? 
There are many people with wonderful papers, certificates, just laying at the desk somewhere. They're not employed. They're qualified, but they're still at home. James is not telling us that I am a bond servant of God and a brother of Jesus. <laughs> that is not his quest. Say, I am a slave to my God, a bond servant to my Lord Jesus Christ. Because um, the Apostle Paul testifies about him, say the Lord Jesus appeared to many people. He appeared to those women. He appeared to the disciples. He appeared to Peter. He appeared to James and also to me. Who is the least of the apostles? Paul says. And when the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to James, the manner of the conversation that happened, I do not know. All I know and would read into is that this visitation left him a broken man. He thought about his life. He thought about what he did say, the dumb things he said to his Lord then. Because they are men, perhaps they fought a little bit. <laughs> You know, they wrestled as men. They're like, man, we wrestled that day, he won. We arm wrestled, he won. <laughs> we were lifting heavy stuff. He was always on the move. He was also working and working and doing stuff. But I said a lot of dumb things. <laughs> How do I take them back? Now that I know the truth. But you know, in him there is grace and mercy. He forgives us of all the dumb things we have done. I'm a born servant of our Lord Jesus Christ. I do not portray myself because I have a close relationship with my Lord Jesus Christ. I don't want to take that as a point of advantage over people. The way he saved me, that is the same way he saved the apostle Peter and Paul and the rest of us. He greets them and straight away he goes to what he wants to talk about. Say, my brethren... Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. That is amazing, right? <laughs> Who, in their right mind, wants to rejoice when they go through trials? Who wants to say, well, trials... I'm ready for you. I'm going to rejoice. <laughs> that is my portion. We get agitated. We, we get mad. We, we say words we shouldn't have said when this trial comes our way, depending with what they are. So as we have read through, we'll see that there will be a lot of testings and trials in our lives. And when we face trials, there are two realities that comes with it. The first reality is the physical reality of the situations. The physical reality. And number two is the spiritual aspect of it when it comes. The way we'll respond to the trials that comes our way will actually inform us of the one that we follow, the one that we believe in.
There's a man called Job. You guys know him. Let me read what he writes for us here. In the book of Job. Let me find it. See, it's in the Bible somewhere here. Job chapter 1. Let's pick it up from verses 20. Or let me just read from verses 19. This is a continuation of the truth that were coming to this man Job. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and stuck the four corners of the house and it fell on the young people and they died. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Now everyone was coming with all these tragedies that happened and things that were happening. Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head. And he fell to the ground and did what? And he worshipped. This, this amazes me. To receive all this news, bad news after bad news after bad news, and what he did was to go on his knees and worship. You know the reason why it is hard for many of us to worship God amidst the troubles is because our possessions have possessed us. We have a lot of idols in our houses, a lot of idols in our pockets, a lot of big idols in our accounts and cards, so that when we lose them, we lose ourselves and we lose our minds. What is our response when these things happen to us? He fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I must confess to you, brothers and sisters, I do not have that kind of strength. To say these words when I'm troubled, when you have lost your house, you've been building it for years, beautiful and the grass is looking amazing and everything in your compound is amazing. And then when you're just sitting to start enjoying it, you, you guys think about just in Nairobi what happened with the floods. Where? In Karen. And then most of these estates in the high rise, the whole compound that is fenced up, you can't see anywhere inside. That was a level of waters in this compound. I would want to have a conversation with, you know, one of those homeowners to see. To, to hear their hearts about this situation. Because it didn't come to us here, we we're like, they're fine. It is never fine with people. People go through heartaches. <laughs> they spend a lot of money building this, and they lose it just in a moment. What do you do in such situations? the tests of trials. These are the physical realities of what we The physical reality of what we read from Job is everything is washed away. Things are burnt. 
But one thing he remembered, that because I trust in God, internally, this is not supposed to break me. That is why he went on his knees and worshipped. And he said these beautiful words. <laughs> I didn't bring any of this. I have skills. I can build stuff. I can work on stuff. I can do a lot of things. I did not come with all these skills. It is the Lord who provided. You know, a lot of people in the world, when they're skillful, they can figure out things in their computers. They think they're, you know... In our generation today with AI, you know, you, 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 you program things and you set them to this program and it cleans them for you. It, it generally makes a lot of things for you, make, making life easier for us. And we think, you know, man, these things that we have, God does not have any idea. <laughs> How dumb can we be? These things, they can be washed in a minute. The physical reality, we see them. But the spiritual aspect of it, the spiritual reality should help us to keep on moving regardless. Regardless, you've lost this, but what are you going to say? Blessed be the name of the Lord. He gives and he takes away. People lose their phones and they run crazy. You lose your tulululu, your kabambe phone. 999, you lose your mind. <laughs> we are so attached to the things we have. And number two, which is the greatest test, is the test of integrity. In the middle of all these trials, the test of integrity comes therein. He writes here in verses um, 21. So therefore... Lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to do what? To save your soul. Filthiness is not integrity. You got to leave it aside. Normally, when we face trials, when things happen to us, there is always the fear of the next step. What am I going to do? I've lost my job. I've lost my home. I've lost my marriage. I've lost my children. I've lost everything. Then comes the fear. What am I going to do next? Even the very spiritually minded, we have fear, don't we? What am I going to do? Where am I going to start? My kids, they're going to think I'm not a good parent. What am I going to do? And what do you do? But be doers of the word. And not hearers only, deceiving yourself. You know, sometimes we do not accept that we have deceived ourselves because we listen, but we probably don't pay attention to the words that God speaks to us. It's like a highway. Here to the other side, express highway, right? <laughs> We don't pay attention to the details of what God is speaking. And also getting 
the heart of what James is writing for us, a first-hand information of a man who is telling us, don't just be listeners. In other words, he said, I listened a lot to Jesus, but I never pay attention to what he actually meant when he spoke to us. Do you think he did not speak the words of the kingdom to his brothers and sisters? Do you think he didn't? He did. Even at the age of 12, he was there at the temple speaking to these elders and they were amazed that he spoke as the one having authority. Which means the brothers knew. But they never paid attention. Friends, you, you can be a listener for all you want. <laughs> if you don't pay attention to the details of what God is saying, you're going to miss the point. You're going to miss it. Say, hey, what, what is God saying to you today? Or is there anything God is saying to you? Are you paying attention? Are you receiving from him? Are you rejoicing? In our right minds, we don't think of joy or joyfulness amid suffering. We want to be frustrated a little bit. We want to respond to the heartings. They say that hard people hurt people, right? Those who are hurt, they tend to hurt people. <laughs> Don't go that direction when you're offended, when you lose things. Friends, there are temptations that come to us. Sometimes they'll come to you through your possessions, the things you have. And you know, normally we are a very wonderful people. Before someone would get into our way, before someone would cross our line, before someone would cut us off. Until then, we are heavenly bound and earthly loosed. Whatever happens, we're fine. Until someone crosses a line. Perhaps you were in the conference last week and you've heard Genesis 1, 2, 3. And then it is break time for lunch here. A lot of lines here. And then two people come and they cut you off the line. <laughs> and all you're thinking in your flesh, <laughs> do, do they know who I am? Do they know how long I've been standing here? Do they know my situation? Do they know how bad I need this food? I've been here all morning. Do, you, you're about to lose yourself just in the queue. Or you're just driving, you know. They, they say about us Kenyans that we are very kind, right? We are very kind. We are nice people. We, we greet people everywhere. Even when we don't want to, like, hi. Mambo, <laughs> everywhere on the street, and people are like, yeah. And then the same Kenyans, we, me, get into the vehicle to start driving, and something happens. <laughs> we're crazy. <laughs> the way we drive, we're crazy people. And then because we... We want to show them that we are crazy too. We follow the craziness. So you drive us, I drive us, so we follow each other. It's a race, especially when with the picky. For men, it's hilarious. 
You overtake a one picky guy, it is now a full-on race. Some picky, you think like they're going to break down right there. And you know the professionals are these small vehicles. They were silly drivers. They overtake you, sure, and then they come in front of you and they go nowhere. <laughs> they stay right there. They start to drive pole pole. <laughs> and you're like, man, do people cut you off and you say, God bless you, brother. <laughs> Who does that? No one does that in my flesh. I don't. I want to smack them on the face. I want to hurt them. I want them to feel the pain. (laughs) How do we respond to situations like that? You know, road rage and things happening on the marketplace and all these things. Whatever your situation might be, how do we respond to them? Do you count them all joy? When you fall into various temptations, knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? Patience. God, you know, I I used to think I was a very patient guy a long time ago. I deceived myself (laughs) into thinking that I'm very patient. Until I own a very small car. (laughs) And until... I got married, hallelujah, amen, and until I have a child, my patience has been tried, friends. <laughs> and it is on trial every day of my life. <laughs> I have to be sober. And those who are married, they probably would say, well, we understand you at least. <laughs> These testings and trials, what do they produce in you? Do they produce bitterness, anger? You carry things you should have left long time ago. Or when one thing is, one thing is happening, it triggers everything that happened 13 years ago. Like you did this, you did this, you did this. You must pay for all of them right now right now. But as we are striving for patience, he says, if any one of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. In in, in other words, he's saying, I know You all like it. If you want it, it's available. Ask. Ask of God. He will give you wisdom to know how to go about various situations that comes, to know how to respond to people, to know how to minister to people, not in your own wisdom. By the way, did you realize that He says that wisdom that we have that is earthly is devilish, is of Satan. So if you have wisdom, he says it's crafty too. So if your wisdom is craftiness, it does not proceed from the father of light, he says it's satanic. (laughs) Satanic. So you who think you know, ah, that was, you know, you, you give a little bribe on the road. It's like, man, I had wisdom. <laughs> this is my wisdom. Help me with the officers. I should have been in prison right now. But man, I got this. No, you don't have. <laughs> You've lost it all. It is satanic to think that you, you know, through your bribe, you're able to save yourself. You're able to make a way for yourself. Trials will come, friends. What are we going to do? 
amidst all these trials. You're going to praise God and sing hallelujah to the Lamb of God? No one naturally plans for these trials to come. But in the world that we live in, they are bound to happen. And sometimes they happen even daily. If you don't seek for wisdom daily, the enemy is going to hit you down so hard. James, the elder and the bishop of the church of uh, Jerusalem, he humbly exhort us to be mindful of the things we say. And even in our service to the kingdom, he say, ha, huh, don't lie to yourself. You, you say you help people. You say you do this. No, true religion is this, to visit orphans and widows in their troubles and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Be ye holy as I am holy. In other words, he's saying, hey, this call is greater than what you think. We are called unto holiness. We are called unto righteousness. Trusting in Christ guarantees eternity in heaven. And that eternity with our Father includes a crown of life for those who trusted him through the trials in this world. In the middle of all these things, you trusted God, or you'd say like Paul, I have run the race. I have fought the good fight of faith. What I'm looking forward to, the crown. My, my eyes are gazing upon the prize, the heavenly prize. What about you, my brother, my sister? You're looking unto heaven, even in the middle of all these trials. We know that the many things we crave for, the many things we desire, a lot of them actually comes from God. But then when he blesses us with them, we turn and worship the things he's given us. But we don't worship God. To move away from God in the middle of all these trials is to move away from your protection, from the favor of God from the hand of God. So dear brothers and sisters, as I welcome the worship team to come, be mindful for what the apostle or what the bishop of this church at Jerusalem, James, says to us. Say, blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Friends, there is a crown of life that is promised to those who love him. Not just those who love him when everything is fine. To those who love him, regardless of our circumstances, whether in luck, whether in, in the middle of the, the natural calamities like the floods and houses are collapsing and people are losing their vehicles because of one reason or, or, or another, are you going to lose yourself too? Blessed is the man who endures temptation. Temptations. Blessed is you, I would say, who endures temptation. 
for when he has been what? Approved. That process happens right here with how we respond to temptations, to trials. You're going to say, well, God, because I've lost all these things, I don't have your business. I will not worship you. That means you only worship God because of the things you have. I covet a people who will worship the Lord for who he is, regardless. I want to be that person who will worship the king for who he is. I want to pay attention when he speaks to me, not just running through my ears, but I, I listen as I read. I want to think about it. I want to internalize what this means to me. What God is really saying to me. Because I know the Lord speaks to you. As Josh said it last week, if you want to audibly hear the voice of God, audibly read the Bible. It is God's word. It is God's breath for us. Don't run away when you're troubled. Don't run away. You know, in, a, in our local language or slang, when things are not all right, we say, Mambo yangu yendi. Even when your mambo is not ending, <laughs> the Lord is still on the throne. Even when you don't feel it, even when you don't see it, the Lord is on the throne. He's never been mindful of your business like he is today. Do you know why? You have breath in your lungs today. What a blessing. You have sound mind. What a blessing. You can move. What a blessing. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. We know you're good all the times. Our situation do not in any way dictate your goodness. You're perfect in all of your ways. A lot. As many as we are gathered here in your name, perhaps we have people here who are right in the middle of a trial. Maybe some of us have lost their loved ones. Maybe we have people that we love that are not well. It's either they're prodigals or they're sick in their bodies and our hearts goes out for them. We are troubled for that son and daughter who doesn't have a job. We are troubled for that teenager who is not right with you. And we have very many voices in our minds, we hear things. Some voices are telling us to give up. But your voice, your still voice this morning, tells us to continue forging on, to continue trusting, continue believing. God, we thank you for you here with us. 
I pray for every individual in this room that you would pour your spirit upon each one of us for we all need you. For those of us who are not feeling well, I pray for your strength in our bones. I pray that you'd revive us, Holy Spirit. I pray that you'd work in us this morning. Even in our frustrations, in our anger, in our outburst of anger, Lord, I pray that we will not lose our minds. I will still be able to say these words like Job, blessed be the name of the Lord. So we thank you. As we also serve you with the offerings and our finances, Lord, we pray that we'll give as we did purpose in our hearts to give to you a glorifying percentage to you, our Lord and our King. Without anyone coercing us, we give joyfully to you. We bless you. And we praise you for all that you have done. In Jesus' name, amen.